We want to be a faithful people. We want to demonstrate our love and affection for our Savior. And the way that Messiah taught us to do that is to demonstrate His love to other people. When we look at the Word of God, we find that there's an inherent relationship between loving God and keeping His commandments. And in the last days, we're going to see that keeping obedience with God is going to bring you into warfare with the government. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Revelation and chapter 3. We're going to begin this final session looking at this congregation in a place called Philadelphia. And we read in verse 7, And to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say the holy and the true one, the one who has the key of David. Now, there are certain words in the Bible that relate to the kingdom of God. And one word is this word, David. God made a covenant with David concerning one of his descendants who would be king of kings. And when we talk about that key of David, we're talking about access to the kingdom. And what we learn from this first verse is this one who is holy, relating to the purposes of God, this one who is true, that relates to the revelation of God. So we see if we want to be obedient to the purposes of God, it is dependent upon us to cling to his truth. He's the one that has the key of David. And notice it speaks about his absolute authority over the kingdom. The one who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Now, what he's speaking about here is there's no way into the kingdom apart from him. And not just through saying, I believe in him, but acknowledging who he is. If you do not recognize, and this is foundational, if you do not recognize his divinity, you don't know him. You don't realize the gospel is that God has become our salvation. That's what we learn from Isaiah. And therefore, when we look prophetically, especially emphasizing what the original language says, it is very powerful in Hebrew that we see that God has manifested himself fully and completely through his arm. The word is Zeroa. Now, that's an important word because we see Isaiah speaks about the arm of the Lord. But only in Hebrew do we have a lower portion of the arm, which is called by a different word. This upper portion is related to a sacrificial location, meaning this. It's this upper portion which is permissible for the sacrifice. It is the chief part. And therefore, when Messiah is called the arm of the Lord, that same word for arm relates to son. It's equally translated as the son of the Lord. That word is used to signify that he is going to be sacrificed for us. And that sacrifice has kingdom and redemptive implications. Why do I say that? Well, if you ever celebrate Passover, and I would encourage you to do so, and you look at that Seder plate, the portion that relates to the lamb, we normally place today a lamb's bone, the shank, and it's called Zeroah. And in the same way that that word is found in Isaiah relating to the one who is going to bring about salvation. So it speaks about his 
absolute authority to carry out a sacrifice that brings eternal redemption to his people. And through redemption, we have kingdom access. He says in verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you a door, and this is what I like, a door that has been opened. Who's opened it? He has in our behalf. Now, if you look at many of the scholars, they say something that I find very well. I like their interpretation. Because an open door relates to an invitation. We are being invited to experience this, this kingdom reality that comes through this key of David. He is the absolute authority of it. He has set before us a door that has been opened and once again. And no one is able to close it. And why has he opened it before? It says, because you have a little power. Why is that a term of encouragement? You have a little power. What he's revealing in this verse is whatever we lack, he is willing to supply so that we can experience a kingdom eternity. Good news. Don't have any excuses. I don't have this. I don't have enough of that. It doesn't hold up. Whatever you lack, he's able to solve that problem. He says here, middle of verse 8, in spite of the fact that you have a little power, he says, and you have kept my word. And notice something. Keeping his word has an outcome. There is a result from it. And you have not denied my name. Now, do you see a principle? When we look at Scripture and how it's put together and inspired by the Holy Spirit, it teaches us principles. And when we keep His Word, the keeping of His Word will work in our life in a way that causes us never, never to deny Him. If you don't keep His Word you are going to deny him. The word produces power to in, endure and have that, that godly testimony. He says in verse 9, Behold, and remember, our God is a God of justice. He is a God of retribution. Why do I say that? Look carefully at verse 9. I will set, and the implication is those. I will set those from the synagogue of Satan. We are revisiting that term. Those who say about themselves that they are Jews. But notice, but they are not. What are they? Liars. And what is he going to do with them? He is going to humble them and exalt us. Now, God is looking, if you know your Bible well, He is looking for those that He can exalt. And He's very much aware of those that He is going to humble. And you need to make a decision. Which one am I going to be? It's, didn't ask, I didn't ask you which one do you want to be. That's irrelevant. It's based upon your behavior. It's based upon what you do with His Word and how you testify, behave in the midst of the enemy. He promises this. He says, behold, that means pay attention. I will set those from the synagogue of Satan who call themselves Jews but are not. They are liars. Behold, I will make them that they should come and there's going to be a change. They are going to worship 
before you at your feet. What it speaks about is that they're going to acknowledge you and that through you, they've learned something. There's going to be a change. Now, I am grateful, I am thankful that in the last days, there is going to be that remnant of Israel that comes to salvation, that one-third according to the prophecy of Zechariah. But there's also going to be a remnant of the nations. Why is that? Because God and His callings and His gifts are irrevocable, Paul tells us. He has a plan, a good plan. And that plan is to use Israel in order to bless the nations. And when Israel in the last days comes to faith, we all know that verse, that there's going to be 10 men from every nation that grabs onto the titsit, that, that fringe garment, and say to the Jewish man, we have heard that God is, what does the Bible say? With you. That is so informative, that word, with. Because the rabbis teach, and I agree with them, this word, with, is a redemptive word. The only way that we can be with God is by means of redemption. And therefore, those individuals that's going to grab that fringe garment, they're going to understand the redemption of God that's come to that remnant of Israel. And we're going to see a Passover experience. In the same way in Egypt, going back 3,500 years ago, there was the children of Israel that came out and that mixed multitude. And the Talmud speaks about how was the first redemption, so too will be the final redemption. Meaning this, it's not just going to be about Israel. I believe all of us, we have that special love for that nation of Israel. But also we see that Israel is going to be used by God in order to fulfill his call, and that is to be a blessing to the nations. And what the scripture's revealing here is that there's going to be that remnant that thought that they were Jewish, or at least proclaimed that they were Jewish, but they were lying. And God is going to make them that they should come and worship before your feet, and that they shall know that I have what? Loved you. God's love brings about a change. If it can bring about a change in these individuals who belong to that synagogue of Satan, it can bring about a change in anyone. And we are called, what is our purpose as believers? To demonstrate God's love to others. But God's love is not a love that compromises the truth. But the love of God works in your life the same way that it works in my life to cause us to be zealous. We'll come to that word in a moment. To be zealous for his truth. Never believe that love causes us to be casual with the things of God or to discard something that's in the Bible. The love of God is a passion for truth. He says here, verse 10, because you have kept my word of what? Endurance. Over and over we see that in the last days, the message of Messiah for the body of believers is a message of endurance and perseverance. Now, if you have a theology that says, you know, one day things are going to be normal and I'm going to be removed. Why is he telling the church that you need to have that spirit of endurance and perseverance? There is a time coming for believers to demonstrate 
endurance. To bear witness to the fact that we are the ones whom he has loved and the ones that he has empowered to demonstrate righteousness in the midst of a lawless world. That's our purpose. As things get more and more corrupt, and can't you see that's happening today? As it gets more and more corrupt, let me say it differently, as it becomes darker and darker and darker, your light can shine brighter. That darkness can be used for the glory of God in order that they can see you more clearly. That love, that righteousness, that commitment to the truth of God. And that is going to bring a remnant unto him. He is going to use these dark times, these unrighteous times for his glory. He says, look again at verse 10. Because you have kept my word of endurance, I also shall keep you from the hour of testing or trials that is coming upon the world, the whole world. Now, what is he referring to, this time of trial or testing? Now, if you read carefully the book of Revelation, you will find that John speaks of two groups of people. He speaks about those that are in heaven, even though bodily they're not in heaven. They simply belong to the kingdom. They have a heavenly citizenship. And he speaks about those who dwell upon the earth. Who are they? Those who belong to this world. And this time of trouble that he's speaking to, look carefully, verse 10. He says, and I will keep you from the hour of, of trial that is coming upon the whole world to test them. And here's what he says. Those who dwell upon the earth. In the book of Revelation, that term, the ones who dwell upon the earth, do not belong to God. They do not belong to the congregation of the redeemed. Those who dwell upon the earth are earthly minded. They are worldly individuals. And they are going to experience this time of God's wrath being poured out. Now in the book of Revelation, there are two expressions of God's judgment, his wrath. When we look at the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, we are not, hear that carefully, we are not speaking about the wrath of God. It is only in the sixth seal that the wrath of the Lamb, I think that's interesting, don't you? That the wrath of the Lamb is mentioned. But it has not come. In chapter 7, we see an angel saying, don't harm the earth, the trees, anything in it, until we have sealed the servants of God. And it's speaking about that 144,000 that are on the earth that relate to the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's only after the sealing end in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, I believe that we have a description of what's alluded to here. He says, I will save you, keep you, from the time that's coming, this time of my judgment, this time of my wrath. I believe he's speaking to here the promise of the rapture. And in Revelation chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10, I believe we have a description of just that event. He says, look at verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have in order that no one should take your crown. Again, finish 
well. Come to the end in faithfulness. Be a servant until the day that you die. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold on to what you have in order that no one can take your crown. To the one who overcomes, I will give him, and I love this, I will give to him or set him as a pillar in the sanctuary, that's what it says, not temple, but the sanctuary of my God. Now, why would he say that? I want to share with you. I want to be that pillar. Why? Now, if you look at 2 Chronicles and chapter 3 and verse 17, there's an emphasis, and we're talking about Solomon's temple. There's an emphasis in that verse on two pillars. And these pillars have names. Why? Well, these two pillars are called Yachin and Boaz. Now, names have meaning in the Bible. The term Yachin means he will prepare, he will establish. And Boaz, in fact, we had a men's meeting yesterday. We studied Boaz. And hopefully all of those men that were there remember what the name Boaz means. It's awful quiet. <laughs> With power. What's he promising here? He will make us as a pillar in the sanctuary, he says, of my God. He's promising to establish us with power. That's what he's going to do. The power of God is going to transform us, make us into that pillar in the sanctuary. Now, it's the word sanctuary and not the temple. See, if it was temple, it would be the Greek word heron. This is the word neos. It's speaking about the holy of holies. Why is that important? You know, it's, it's wonderful to be a pillar at the temple. But it is a better position to be a pillar in the sanctuary of God. Why? That's where God is in a unique way. That location, you can read about it in the book of Numbers, chapter 7 and verse 89. When Moses goes into the Holy of Holies in order to do something, to, to sanctify the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And as he goes in, he approaches the Ark of the Covenant behind the, the veil. And he hears the voice of God speaking to him between the two cherubim from that mercy seat. And the message is this. I will make you a pillar in the sanctuary of God. It's speaking about us being established with power in order that we might be, hear this, that we might be in his presence. Isn't that great news? God is going to position us with power that we can be in his presence. And outside, outside, he will not go out. Meaning we're going to get there and we're going to stay there forever and ever and ever. And he says, I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. What's that city? The new Jerusalem. Remember, new, a kingdom word. And I love to share that that term, Yerushalayim. See, names, not just names of people, but names of places have significance. And that name, Jerusalem, means to inherit, to take possession of the word Lareshet, to take possession of, and the word Shalom, we've already discussed it. Shalom is related to 
the fulfillment of the will of God. We are going to take possession of God's fulfilled plan. And what was his plan? You only have to go back to Genesis 12 and that Abrahamic covenant where God desires to do one thing and that is to bless the families of the earth. That's our God. Our God is a God that delights in blessing. Now, there's a contrast, is there not? Because Satan is willing to sacrifice everything in order that you might suffer forever. And God the Father is willing to suffer, have suffer his only begotten son in order that he might bless you for eternity. Do you see that great distinction? Don't fall for deception. If you are deceived, if you don't take this book seriously, if you don't apply it to your life, you are going to be deceived and you are going to be taken down and you are going to know the depths of Satan and you are going to experience what Messiah warns. He says, outside, remember the terminology, look carefully at the scripture. He says in the middle of verse 12, and outside, you will not go outside. Now I'm looking at this translation and it doesn't have that phrase outside two times. But in the original, it does. Why? Well, it's the same thing that Messiah says that's oftentimes ignored by translations. He says, outside, they will be cast outside. He says it twice. Where there are three things. What are those? Weeping. There is crying and the gnashing of teeth. There is fear, that is darkness is fear. Crying is sorrow. And the gnashing of teeth is torment, pain. And these things are eternal. Those who are deceived by the enemy, that is their eternity. But those who humble themselves, confess Messiah, believe in his blood that was sacrificed in order to bring about eternal redemption, those individuals will be heirs of the promises of God. We can say that differently. They will take possessions of God's eternal blessings. And they won't be outside in darkness but they'll be in the glory of God. He says, they will not go outside, outside anymore, for I will write upon them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, the one which comes down out of heaven from my God, and the name, my name, my new name, I will write upon them. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 14. Now we come to the seventh and final congregation. That one of Laodicea. And we see that there is one major problem with this congregation. Let's see what it is. Look at verse 14. And to the messenger of the congregation of Laodicea, write, these things say the amen. Now, that word amen relates to truth. It is a call to believe and to believe in him, for he is the faithful and true witness. Now, we can translate that word because in Greek is the word martus, where we get the English word martyr. He is the faithful and true martyr. He went through it. He was hated. He was persecuted. And we as disciples will suffer that same persecution. 
And some of you, if you are alive in those last days, will be put to death. He's also spoken here as the, and Bibles translate this next word differently, but let's learn it first. We've all heard of the term the archangel. Now, ark is ruler. Biblically, there's only one archangel. It's Michael. One archangel, ruling angel. And here it basically says, some Bibles say beginning, but in the Hebrew, that word like Bereshit in the beginning comes from the word head. It's a word of authority. And that's really how we should understand this, that he is the authority, he is the head of the creation of God. In fact, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, he is the creator. He was never created. There was never a time, hear this carefully, there was never a time that Messiah did not exist. He is eternal. And he is the head over creation of God. And this one, who's created all things and all things in him consist, he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or that you were hot, but because you are cold and you because you are lukewarm, excuse me, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to vomit you from my mouth. Pretty strong words. Pretty descriptive words. What is the problem with the Laodicea church? They lack zeal. They have no commitment that is pleasing to him. Now, we are in the biblical month, the sixth month, which is Elul. And Elul is a special month because every day of that month, except for Shabbat, the shofar is sounded. And the shofar, many people will say it's about repentance. Well, that month is the month of repentance. But the shofar really is about something else. When we hear the shofar, we are called to remember what God has provided for life. Remember, he provided that ram that was caught in the thicket with his hordes? That's the shofar. And when we hear that unique sound of the shofar, we are called to remember his provision for life. And if we truly have received his provision, and what was that provision? The blood of his son. If we truly have received his life that gives us eternal life, the evidence of that is that we're going to be committed, zealous people for the things of God. And this is what he's chastening the church of Laodicea for. They're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm. They are indifferent to the things of the kingdom. And that is manifested by a unwillingness to apply the truth to their life. See, it's not by accident that Messiah says, I am the true and faithful martyr. For what he was committed to, his life reflected that. Does yours? This church was indifferent to the sacrifice of Messiah and the life of Messiah that they were called to demonstrate in their new life. He says, Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to vomit you from my mouth because you say I am wealthy and that I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. 
That's their perspective. They have made themselves rich with the things of this world to the extent when they evaluate themselves, that's the month of Elul, evaluate. We use the term cheshbon nefesh. Cheshbon is, you know, you go to a restaurant and at the end, they total up. They do the calculation. That's what cheshbon is in Hebrew. A calculation of what you owe. And then you're called to make peace, le shalem, from the word shalom, to make peace with that build. And how do you make peace? You have to fulfill it. And it's only after fulfilling it that you make peace, that you can leave. And in the same way, we are called uniquely in this month. In fact, in every synagogue throughout the world, they read Psalm 27 about how God and only God can be our light and our salvation. And that we need to consider who we are and the changes that we need to make or have God make in our behalf. That he would supply what we lack. But what's this congregation? We have made ourselves abundant. We have need of nothing. That's their perspective. But Messiah evaluates them and says, but you do not know that you are, and this is his evaluation, that you are wretched and pitiful. Now, do you see the dichotomy? They look in the mirror, they evaluate themselves, and they say, I need nothing. Messiah looks at them. And he uses two words. In fact, one of them probably is better translated with the word, you are miserable. They don't know it. They are so far removed from the truth. Why? Because they're so far removed from the word of God. They don't have that barometer. They don't have that, that lens to see themselves from a godly perspective. And he says that you are poor, blind, and naked. What's naked? Without good deeds. That term nakedness relates biblically to the concept of shame. And if we don't have the works, the evidence that documents our faith, that's what we're called to do. You get up, I don't know what I'm supposed to do today. Document your faith. Show others that you are a believer. And when you say, God, open my eyes. I don't want to be blind. Open my eyes that I can see opportunities where I can show others I belong to you. That I'm in that new covenant, that kingdom covenant. And I behave differently. I have a different perspective. And what I am committed to is righteousness. When you pray, God, help me to demonstrate your righteousness through me, God gets active in your life. God will begin to reveal to you opportunities to serve him that otherwise you would just pass by, that you would ignore. He says here, but you do not know that you are miserable and wretched, that you are poor, blind, and naked. And therefore, he says, he hasn't given up on them. He's got the solution. Look at verse 18. It's a word of counsel. Now, my experience is this. God stands by always to counsel us. In fact... I don't know about you, but I have a wonderful counselor. And he is always there to counsel me, to reveal to me truth, but there's a condition. Because he wants to lead me into righteousness. And if that's not my objective, if that's not what I'm committed to, then he's going to be silent. 
But when I pray sincerely, God, I want to behave righteously because my utmost desire, my zeal, my joy is to manifest your glory through righteousness. Let me tell you, God begins to guide, direct. He gives you revelation and he will supply what is lacking that you can demonstrate his truth and his righteousness through your life. So he says, I counsel you to, many Bibles will say buy. It's that word to acquire. It's a word that, that calls us to possess something. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold. Gold that has been refined by fire, meaning removed all the impurities, that you be wealthy. And he's not talking about wealthy financially. He's talking about being, and I like this term, thoroughly equipped. That you will have the resources that's required to accomplish his will. Not your will, but his will. See, learn a principle we're approaching the fall festivals. So sad that people ignore these days. They are God's appointed days, right? And if you look at that word, many of you know it, moed. You may not know that in that word moed is the word for destination. Now, if you fly L out, no other plane you can do this in, only L out. If you get on an El Al flight, there will be a screen that tells you your destination. And it has that same word, Ya'ad, coming from the word Moed. And what the scripture is telling us is this. It is through the Moedim, these days that God appoints, through them and the acknowledgement of them and the understanding of them, they help you arrive at God's destination for you. And if you ignore them, for example, do you think it's by coincidence? Do you think it's by chance that Messiah was crucified on Passover? Do you think it was by coincidence that he rose from the dead on a special day called Rashid in Hebrew? That first day, meaning the first day of the barley harvest. And do you think it's by coincidence or accident that he poured out his spirit on the feast of weeks? See, too many in the church do not know that Pentecost was celebrated ever since Mount Sinai. We don't know that. We don't know what Pentecost truly is from an Old Testament perspective. And therefore, we think that Acts 2 begins it. It doesn't. It is only when you understand that Feast of Weeks from an Old Testament perspective, then you can truly appreciate what God did in Acts chapter 2. This act of restoration. And who is the restorer? All of these things. He teaches us in order that we can arrive to where he wants us to be. So he says, I counsel you that you acquire from me this gold that's been refined by fire in order that you be in abundance. Now, what the scripture tells us, on Yom Kippur, there's a tradition to read, Yona the prophet. Did Yona want to that's Jonah. Did he want to serve God? No. And what he did, God gave him a call. He wasn't committed to it. And if you read carefully in Hebrew, what it says about Jonah is he goes down to Yafo. He goes down into the boat. He goes down into the lower parts of the boat. And he goes down into the water. And he goes down into into Sheol. When you are not committed to the will of God, His instruction for your life, 
you are going down. Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord. And when you neglect the instructions of God, whether you know it or not, you are fleeing from the presence of the Lord. When we go our way, it's all on our own account, meaning we pay for everything. But when we go God's way and we're committed to His purposes, God will supply. He will provide everything that we need to serve Him. And it says here, in order that you be in abundance and have white garments wrapped around you, clothed with white garments, in order that, this is what he wants to do, in order that the shame of your nakedness be not manifested. What's he saying? Do it your way and get ready for your shame to be manifested. That's your way. Submit to the call of God for your life. And he is going to supply your every need, not your every want, but your every need in order to live a victorious life that demonstrates his truth, his righteousness, and manifests his glory. Here's the takeaway. Make it very simple. I don't care who you are. When it comes to the end, you are either going to manifest your own shame or manifest the glory of God. There's no position in between. And it's only those who are passionate and committed for his word and for his purposes that's going to be instruments of his glory. Middle of verse 18. And not only by this, this gold, but he also says, because we need vision, by, and, you know, here's where we come to a portion of Scripture that bothers me. And it bothers me for not what is written, but what so many of the commentators say. If you do a study of this church, you will find that Christian commentators tell you that there was one of the best medical schools in all of the world located in Laodicea. The problem is this. I can never verify that in a non-Christian source. Can't find it. Not saying it's not there, but couldn't discern it. And then they talk about this ISAV that in this medical school they were known for their ability to treat blindness. Look up the Christian commentators. Now, what I did is I looked at this word. This word for this unique type of, normally it's translated in your Bible, this ISAF. The problem is, when we look at this word, we find something unique. This is a type of grain, and I thought this was interesting, and you can find this. It is a type of grain that is unleavened. I find significance in that. And it was not, I could not find any extra biblical source, meaning something not from a Christian perspective, that talked about it as an I said. What I found is that it was something that people would eat that was unleavened, that would give them strength that would give them sustenance. And I believe what Messiah is saying is that he's choosing this word, not because of some ISAB that was made from it, but he's talking and emphasizing this unleavened grain that we need to apply it to our life, that we need to be an unleavened people in order that we can see clearly. Now, we know that unleavenedness relates to that which is not contaminated or tainted by sin. Leaven represents pride. And when we walk in pride, we are quenching the Spirit of God. 
When you act in pride, God is going to put you in time out. That's just how he works. It is only when you understand yourself and how God sees you, which is humbling, that you will be used by God, that you will be equipped by God, and that you will carry out the purposes of God. But it begins with you seeing correctly. So he says, in the same way, acquire this, this unleavened grain and anoint your eyes in order that you might see. For I, he's talking about Messiah, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, he says, therefore, be zealous. And what does that zeal lead you to do? Repent. When you are zealous for the things of God, you are naturally going to live a repentant life. What does that mean? You're going to do what? Agree with God. I can promise you something. You will never get into trouble by agreeing with God. Never. Every time you say, yes, Lord, you are going to be positioned in a pathway to victory. Every time you try to get God to agree with you, you are going to be spiritually frustrated. You are going to find that God's provision isn't going to fill your life. So be wise, be humble, agree with God. Verse 20. Behold, remember that phrase, pay attention. Behold, I stand at the door and I am knocking. And again, it's this broad invitation. And whoever will, it begins with hearing. See, most people in this world are not open to listening to God. They want to listen to whoever tells them what they want to hear. And you know who's waiting for the opportunity to tell you in a deceptive way what you want to hear? It's that liar, the father of lies. And he can always, always get you to believe if you're committed to your will and not God's will. He can always get you to believe what he wants you to know, what he wants you to think. In other words, he is very good deceiving. Now, if you look sometime at 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, we see a principle. Those who are going to be deceived, the scripture says this, that God is going to bring about, your Bible may say, strong delusion. It doesn't say that in the biblical language. It says that God is going to allow, to bring about, the working out of deception. Why? Why would God allow the outcome, the results, for you to be deceived? He tells us. Because you did not believe the truth. The principle is this. When you say no to the truth, you are going to be deceived every time by the enemy. And in this passage, what does he say? He says, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever, doesn't matter who, whoever should listen to my voice and open the door. What's he looking for? People who respond to him. And responding to him means to acknowledge his true identity. He says, behold, I stand at the door knocking. 
And whoever listens to my voice and opens the door, I will enter in unto him. And I will dine, and there's this word, with him. That word with shows redemption. It is through redemption that we can have fellowship. That's what dining is about. I will dine with him and he with me. And this fellowship, this, this communion that we have with Messiah is going to produce something. And what is that? Keep reading. Look at verse 21. And the one who overcomes. How else can we translate that? The one who has victory. It's only through this intimacy with him that comes only through redemption. And you must respond to his voice. Faith comes by hearing. That's what he says. Anyone who hears my voice, he says, I will enter in unto him. I will dine with him and him with me. And to this one who overcomes, over and over, we're called to be overcomers. I will give to him, I like this, to sit again with me on my throne. Now, if you know the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation goes through a, a process where Messiah is the one who sits before the throne, on the side of the throne, and then he sits on the throne with his father. So there's this process of intimacy, whereby we learn from that who he truly is. He sits upon the throne of God. Doesn't that mean something about his identity? And what happens? Well, he is going to bring us into intimacy with him. We're going to have his authority. That's why we receive that new body so that we can rule and reign with him. And he says, and I will give him victory and that he will sit with me. He will, as I have, vic excuse me, verse 21, and as I have had victory and I sit with my father on his throne, we are going to have that same experience with Messiah. That we are going to be brought into intimacy with him. And that we are going to have victory. What type of victory? Eternal victory. Last verse, verse 22. He concludes it by admonishing us to be people that listen. And listen to his word. We read, To the one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let me begin to conclude by asking you, are you listening to the Spirit? What does the Spirit reveal to us? Well, if you go back to Genesis 1, the Spirit of God brings about the order of God. When we look at creation, we see that it was empty, void, formless, Hebrew, tohu ve vohu. It lacked order. It did not manifest the glory of God. And it was only through the Spirit and God did something. God spoke. It is through the Spirit and the Word. Remember that. It is through the Spirit and the Word that we can find God's order. And what is God's order in His eyes? Tov me'od. Very good. The question is this. You have a limited amount of time left. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to be a good steward? Are you going to use all of your resources like that unjust steward in Luke 16 that we are admonished to, to learn from? Why? He used everything that he could 
to secure for himself the future that he wanted. And Messiah is saying, utilize all your resources that you presently have. Utilize them. Be a good steward of them. Because what you do with them is going to determine the future, your eternal future. Not just where you're going to be, that's a gospel matter. But what you're going to experience in that kingdom. I want to remind you, nowhere in the Bible does it say that that kingdom experience is the same for all believers. It's not. We need to realize that it's only when we utilize His Word, His truth, His anointing, that we can have a kingdom experience that is going to be a blessing. See, here's the problem. I hear so many times people say this, and I believe it's one of the most foolish statements and God-dishonoring statements that I've heard. People say this. You know, as long as I'm in the kingdom, that's all that matters to me. Foolishness. Why? Because we, the scripture says, it's necessary to appear before the judgment seat of who? Christ. And what are we going to do there? That judgment is not about where we're spending eternity. That judgment is to evaluate what our life, since the day that we believed, what our life has meant for the kingdom. And all these rewards, hopefully, that you have, they manifest your love for Messiah. But if you lack rewards, if you're empty, yes, you'll be in the kingdom of God, but you won't have anything that manifests your love for him. Don't be a selfish and a thankless believer. Make a determination today that you want to live a life that demonstrates to him and to all others your great and abiding love and appreciation for the Father's love that sent his Son into this world to die a death of humiliation and great agony in order to secure eternity for you in the presence of God. Make this Shabbat a special one. Make it one that you are going to look back at and see that a kingdom change came into your life. Now, before we, we conclude, I would be remiss. I said earlier, it is my belief that the vast majority of you are believers. But perhaps there's someone here that has not received that gospel message, that has never confessed, I'm a sinner. And I'm trusting in the blood of Messiah that was shed on Passover to secure for me eternal redemption. We mention the book of life. More precisely, it says, the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you are without hope. And you will not experience those kingdom blessings. You are going to be outside, outside, in darkness, with weeping, in the gnashing of teeth. You can change that forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are indeed Savior. And for anyone who has not received you, Lord, may they hear you knocking and may they respond to your voice right now. We pray that they would confess 
They're not perfect. But they have fallen short of your glory and that they have sinned. But they are trusting right now in your promise. They are accepting by faith the death of Messiah and the shedding of his blood to purchase for them eternal redemption. For anyone who says, I want that, who will confess their sin and believe in Messiah, dead, crucified, but having been raised from the dead, you can receive that new life, that eternal life right now by simply saying, I receive him into my life as my Savior. I believe he died for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead, signifying that he has eternal life to give to me. Father God, we praise you that you are a holy God, a loving God, a faithful God. And we thank you for this Shabbat. It's in the mighty name of Messiah Yeshua we pray. Amen. Now, we have not concluded our conference. We are going to move into what I believe will be the most important part of our time together, and that is worship. Because the preaching of the Word of God, yes, we do it to honor Him, but it's for the people. But worship is not for us. It is unto the Lord. And I'm grateful that Joshua Aaron got on a plane, flew 22, 23 hours in order that he would be here with us. And tomorrow, very early in the morning, he's going to go back to the airport and get on a plane and fly that same 23 hours so he can spend a day and a half with his family before he gets on another plane so that he can go and lead a conference in Dallas. You know what I see? The zeal of the Lord. So, Joshua, thank you for giving us about three days of your life to be here and lead worship. We thank you for that. Many of you have seen Christian as he has, has led and, and kind of guided us through this conference. But uh, Christian and I, we're going to do on Monday four more videos. We do videos together. That's, that's not Christian. That's Alex. <laughs> and again, these videos that we do together, and in some ways I'm a little bit insecure by this, but my teaching videos never get close to the amount of views that the videos I do with him. It's just a fact. And so I'm grateful for the time and the effort that Christian uh, makes in doing these videos together. And I believe you showed our uh, slide with our YouTube channel. So his videos are there, but also you have your own YouTube channel and you can go to that. You might say something about that in a moment, but we're grateful for our partnership. And again, I want to thank CVM Group. I don't know why M's last. I never have understood that. But, but CV, CVM Group for sponsoring this conference. And you cannot imagine all the work that goes in. We're grateful for them and their love and their friendship and their commitment to kingdom purposes. We are grateful for their daughter who handles our social media. She's promised to explain to me what exactly is social media. <laughs> Never figured that out. We have been blessed by our partnership with Derek Prince Ministries and our friendship with Alex and Frank. I thank the many volunteers that work and labor, not just today, but many days to make this conference possible. We are grateful for the other ministries and we want to encourage you to go out, not now, but later on, and see the tables that have been set up, some wonderful ministries that we partner with and that we, we identify with. So take advantage of their material. And again, 
We are, are thankful for the opportunity to come at least once a year to Australia in order to have our conference. We have been blessed by, by everything we've experienced. We're, we're thankful to you. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.